The Spell of the Sensuous Perception and Language in a More Than Human World by David Abraham The Ecology of Magic A Personal Introduction to the Inquiry Late one evening, I stepped out of my little hut in the rice paddies of eastern Bali and found myself falling through space. Over my head, the black sky was rippling with stars, densely clustered in some regions, almost blocking out the darkness between them, and more loosely scattered in other areas, pulsing and beckoning to each other. Behind them all streamed the great river of light with its several tributaries. Yet the Milky Way churned beneath me as well, for my hut was set in the middle of a large patchwork of rice paddies, separated from each other by narrow two-foot-high dikes, and these paddies were all filled with water. The surface of these pools, by day, reflected perfectly the blue sky, a reflection broken only by the thin, bright green tips of new rice. But by night, the stars themselves glimmered from the surface of the paddies, and the river of light whirled through the darkness underfoot as well as above. There seemed no ground in front of my feet, only the abyss of star-studded space falling away forever. I was no longer simply beneath the night sky, but also above it. The immediate impression was of weightlessness, I might have been able to reorient myself, to regain some sense of ground and gravity, were it not for a fact that confounded my senses entirely. Between the constellations below and the constellations above drifted countless fireflies, their lights flickering like the stars, some drifting up to join the clusters of stars overhead, Others, like graceful meteors, slipping down from above to join the constellations underfoot. And all these paths of light upward and downward were mirrored as well in the still surface of the paddies. I felt myself at times falling through space, at other moments floating and drifting. I simply could not dispel the profound vertigo and giddiness, the paths of the fireflies and their reflections in the water's surface held me in a sustained trance. Even after I crawled back to my hut and shut the door on this whirling world, I felt that now the little room in which I lay was itself floating free of the earth. Fireflies. It was in Indonesia, you see, that I was first introduced to the world of insects, and there that I first learned of the great influence that insects, such diminutive entities, could have upon the human senses. I had traveled to Indonesia on a research grant to study magic. More precisely, to study the relation between magic and medicine, first among the traditional sorcerers, or dukuns, of the Indonesian archipelago, and later among the Zankris, the traditional shamans of Nepal. One aspect of the grant was somewhat unique. I was to journey into rural Asia, not outwardly as an anthropologist or academic researcher, but as a magician in my own right, in hopes of gaining a more direct access to the local sorcerers. I had been a professional sleight-of-hand magician for five years back in the United States, helping to put myself through college by performing in clubs and restaurants throughout New England. I had, as well, taken a year off from my studies in the psychology of perception to travel as a street magician through Europe, and toward the end of that journey had spent some months in London, England, exploring the use of sleight-of-hand 
magic in psychotherapy as a means of engendering communication with distressed individuals largely unapproachable by clinical healers. The success of this work suggested to me that sleight of hand might lend itself well to the curative arts, and I became, for the first time, interested in the relation largely forgotten in the West between folk medicine and magic. It was this interest that led to the aforementioned grant and to my sojourn as a magician in rural Asia. There, my sleight of hand skills proved invaluable as a means of stirring the curiosity of the local shamans. For magicians, whether modern entertainers or indigenous tribal sorcerers, have in common the fact that they work with the malleable texture of perception. When the local sorcerers gleaned that I had at least some rudimentary skill in altering the common field of perception, I was invited into their homes, asked to share secrets with them, and eventually encouraged even urged to participate in various rituals and ceremonies. But the focus of my research gradually shifted from questions regarding the application of magical techniques in medicine and ritual curing towards a deeper pondering of the relation between traditional magic and the animate natural world. This broader concern seemed to hold the keys to the earlier questions for none of the several island sorcerers that I had come to know in Indonesia, nor any of the Zankris with whom I lived in Nepal, considered their work as ritual healers to be their major role or function within their communities. Most of them, to be sure, were the primary healers or doctors for the villages in their vicinity, and they were often spoken of as such by the inhabitants of those villages. But the villagers also sometimes spoke of them in low voices and in private conversations as witches or lejaks in Bali, as dark magicians who at night might well be practicing their healing spells backwards or while turning to the left instead of the right in order to afflict people with the very diseases that they would later work to cure by day. Such suspicions seemed fairly common in Indonesia and often were harbored with regard to the most effective and powerful healers, those who were most renowned for their skill in driving out illness. For it was assumed that a magician, in order to expel malevolent influences, must have a strong understanding of those influences and demons, even in some areas, a close rapport with such powers. I myself never consciously saw any of those magicians or shamans with whom I became acquainted engaged in magic for harmful purposes, nor any convincing evidence that they had ever done so. Few of the magicians that I came to know even accepted money in return for their services, although they did accept gifts in the way of food, blankets, and the like. Yet I was struck by the fact that none of them ever did or said anything to counter such disturbing rumors or speculations which circulated quietly through the regions where they lived. Slowly I came to recognize that it was through the agency of such rumors and the ambiguous fears that such rumors engendered in the village people that the sorcerers were able to maintain a basic level of privacy if the villagers did not entertain certain fears about the local sorcerer, then they would likely come to obtain his or her magical help for every little malady and disturbance. And since a more potent practitioner must provide services for several large villages, the sorcerer would be swamped from morning to night with requests for ritual aid. By allowing the inevitable suspicions and fears to circulate unhindered in the region, and sometimes even encouraging and contributing to such rumors, the sorcerer ensured that only those who were in real and profound need of his skills would dare to approach him for help.
This privacy, in turn, left the magician free to attend to what he acknowledged to be his primary craft and function. A clue to this function may be found in the circumstance that such magicians rarely dwell at the heart of their village. Rather, their dwellings are commonly at the spatial periphery of the community or, more often, out beyond the edges of the village, amid the rice fields, or in a forest or a wild cluster of boulders. I could easily attribute this to the just-mentioned need for privacy. Yet for the magician in a traditional culture, it seemed to serve another purpose as well, providing a spatial expression of his or her symbolic position with regard to the community. For the magician's intelligence is not encompassed within the society, its place is at the edge of the community, mediating between the human community and the larger community of beings, upon which the village depends for its nourishment and sustenance. This larger community includes, along with the humans, the multiple non-human entities that constitute the local landscape. From the diverse plants and the myriad animals, birds, mammals, fish, reptiles, insects, that inhabit or migrate through the region, to the particular winds and weather patterns that inform the local geography, as well as the various landforms, forests, rivers, caves, mountains, that lend their specific character to the surrounding earth. The traditional or tribal shaman I came to discern acts as an intermediary between the human community and the larger ecological field, ensuring that there is an appropriate flow of nourishment, not just from the landscape to the human inhabitants, but from the human community back to the local earth. By his constant rituals, trances, ecstasies, and journeys, he ensures that the relation between human society and the larger society of beings is balanced and reciprocal and that the village never takes more from the living land than it returns to it. Not just materially, but with prayers, propitiations, and praise. The scale of a harvest or the size of a hunt are always negotiated between the tribal community and the natural world that it inhabits. To some extent, every adult in the community is engaged in this process of listening and attuning to the other presences that surround and influence daily life. But the shaman or sorcerer is the exemplary voyager in the intermediate realm between the human and the more than human world, the primary strategist and negotiator in any dealings with the others. And it is only as a result of her continual engagement with the animate powers that dwell beyond the human community that the traditional magician is able to alleviate many individual illnesses that arise within that community. The sorcerer derives her ability to cure ailments from her more continuous practice of healing or balancing the community's relation to the surrounding land. Disease in such cultures is often conceptualized as a kind of systematic imbalance within the sick person or more vividly as the intrusion of a demonic or malevolent presence into his body. There are, at times, malevolent influences within the village or tribe itself that disrupt the health and emotional well-being of susceptible individuals within the community. Yet such destructive influences within the human community are commonly traceable to a disequilibrium between that community and the larger field of forces in which it is embedded. Only those persons who, by their everyday practice, are involved in monitoring and maintaining the relation between the human village and the animate landscape are able to appropriately diagnose, treat, and ultimately relieve personal ailments as well as illnesses that arise within the village. Any healer who was not simultaneously attending to the intertwined relation between the human community and the larger, more-than-human field would likely dispel an illness from one person 
only to have the same problem arise, perhaps in a new guise, somewhere else in the community. Hence, the traditional magician or medicine person functions primarily as an intermediary between human and non-human world, and only secondarily as a healer. Without a continually adjusted awareness of the relative balance or imbalance between the human group and its non-human environment, along with the skills necessary to modulate that primary relation, any healer is worthless, indeed not a healer at all. The medicine person's primary allegiance then is not to the human community, but to the earthly web of relations in which that community is embedded. It is from this that his or her power to alleviate human illness derives, and this sets the local magician apart from other persons. The primacy for the magician of non-human nature, the centrality of his relation to other species and to the earth, is not always evident to Western researchers. Countless anthropologists have managed to overlook the ecological dimension of the shaman's craft, while writing at great length of the shaman's rapport with supernatural entities. We can attribute much of this oversight to the modern civilized assumption that the natural world is largely determinate and mechanical and that that which is regarded as mysterious, powerful, and beyond human ken must therefore be of some other non-physical realm above nature, supernatural. The oversight becomes still more comprehensible when we realize that many of the earliest European interpreters of indigenous lifeways were Christian missionaries, for the church had long assumed that only human beings have intelligent souls, and that the other animals, to say nothing of trees and rivers, were created for no other reason than to serve humankind. We can easily understand why European missionaries, steeped in the dogma of institutionalized Christianity, assumed a belief in supernatural, otherworldly powers among those tribal persons whom they saw awestruck and entranced by non-human, but nevertheless natural, forces. What is remarkable is the extent to which contemporary anthropology still preserves the ethnocentric bias of these early interpreters. We no longer describe the shaman's enigmatic spirit helpers as the superstitious claptrap of heathen primitives, we have cleansed ourselves of at least that much ethnocentrism. Yet we still refer to such enigmatic forces, respectfully now, as supernaturals. For we are unable to shed the sense, so endemic to scientific civilization, of nature as a rather prosaic and predictable realm, unsuited to such mysteries. Nevertheless, that which is regarded with the greatest awe and wonder by indigenous oral cultures is, I suggest, none other than that what we view as nature itself. The deeply mysterious powers and entities with whom the shamans enter into a rapport are ultimately the same forces, the same plants, animals, forests, and winds, that to literate, civilized Europeans are just so much scenery, the pleasant backdrop of our more pressing human concerns. The most sophisticated definition that now circulates through the American counterculture is the ability or power to alter one's consciousness at will. No mention is made of any reason for altering one's consciousness. Yet in tribal cultures, that which we call magic takes its meaning from the fact that humans, in an indigenous or oral context, experience their own consciousness as simply one form of awareness among many others. The traditional magician cultivates an ability to shift out of his or her common state of consciousness 
precisely in order to make contact with the other organic forms of sensitivity and awareness with which human existence is intertwined. Only by temporarily shedding the accepted perceptual logic of his culture can the sorcerer hope to enter into relation with other species on their own terms. Only by altering the common organization of his senses will he be able to enter into a rapport with the multiple non-human sensibilities that animate the local landscape. It is this, we might say, that defines a shaman, the ability to readily slip out of the perceptual boundaries that demarcate his or her particular culture. Boundaries reinforced by social customs, taboos, and most importantly, the common speech or language, in order to make contact with and learn from the other powers in the land. His magic is precisely this heightened receptivity to the meaningful solicitations, songs, cries, gestures, of the larger, more-than-human field. Magic, then, in its perhaps most primordial sense, is the experience of existing in a world made up of multiple intelligences. The intuition that every form one perceives from the swallow swooping overhead to the fly on a blade of grass, and indeed the blade of grass itself, is an experiencing form, an entity with its own predilections and sensations, albeit sensations that are very different from our own. To be sure, the shaman's ecological function his or her role as an intermediary between human society and the land is not always obvious at first blush, even to a sensitive observer. We see the sorcerer being called upon to cure an ailing tribesman of his sleeplessness, or perhaps simply to locate some missing goods. We witness him entering into trance and sending his awareness into other dimensions in search of insight and aid. Yet we should not be so ready to interpret these dimensions as supernatural, nor to view them as realms of entirely internal to the personal psyche of the practitioner. For it is likely that the inner world of our Western psychological experience, like the supernatural heaven of Christian belief, originated in the loss of our ancestral reciprocity with the animate earth. When the animate powers that surround us are suddenly construed as having less significance than ourselves, when the generative earth is abruptly defined as a determinate object devoid of its own sensations and feelings, then the sense of a wild and multiplicitous otherness in relation to which human existence has always oriented itself must migrate into a supersensory heaven beyond the natural world or else into the human skull itself, the only allowable refuge in this world for what is ineffable and unfathomable. But in genuinely oral indigenous cultures, the sensuous world itself remains the dwelling place of the gods, of the numinous powers that can either sustain or extinguish human life. It is not by sending his awareness out beyond the natural world that the shaman makes contact with the purveyors of life and health, nor by journeying into his personal psyche Rather, it is by propelling his awareness laterally, outward, into the depths of a landscape at once both sensuous and psychological, the living dream that we share, with the soaring hawk, the spider, and the stone silently sprouting lichen on its coarse surface. The magician's intimate relationship with non-human nature becomes most evident when we attend to the easily overlooked background of his or her practice, not just to the more visible tasks of curing and ritual aid to which she is called by individual clients, 
or to the larger ceremonies at which she presides and dances, but to the content of the prayers by which she prepares for such ceremonies, and to the countless ritual gestures that she enacts when alone. The daily propitiations and praise that flows from her toward the land and its many voices.